Vital Conversations, and I'm your host today. My name is Johanna Hilla, and I'm the coordinator of education and training here at Vital. And I'm so excited about today's conversation. It's a big passion of mine, and it's a rare treat to get to talk to to other people who are so excited and enthusiastic about the same subject, which is Jungian psychology. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you Ido Cohen and Mackenzie Amara. So um, without further ado, uh, maybe we can just go ahead and get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, Mackenzie, if you would like to start by introducing yourself, that would be just wonderful. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Mackenzie Mara. I'm um, a Jungian analyst in training at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich. I'm originally from California by way of Washington and New York and Brazil and Ecuador, uh, living in Switzerland now. Um, before moving here to train as a Jungian, I did a, my master's in clinical and counseling psychology in New York. Um, and trained as a five rhythms teacher. Um, so I'm also a certified five rhythms teacher and currently working on my doctoral dissertation on um, the use of dreams in psychedelic spaces and integrating psychedelics through dreams. Um, and yeah, psychedelics are a long-standing passion in my life through uh, um, nefarious channels to begin with they, it was it was a it was a dangerous beginning one that I fortunately got through but that's kind of how I find myself here in in the psychedelic space now I had a rough start and a really beautiful learning through that thank you so much Mackenzie and uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you through this year as you have been in my study group over this year, as you are all also a vital student. Um, so um, maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit also how you came to be part of the vital program and how it has been for you. Yeah. Um, vital was kind of put on my radar by a colleague um, at my doctoral program in Saybrook. And... Um, I had been, yeah, kind of trolling the space looking for what are the, what are the avenues to, I guess, legitimize myself and deepen my study um, that will align me with the right people, the right opportunities, the right education to really do this work um, as ethically and um, like well educatedly as possible moving forward. Um, and vital seemed like a great opportunity and it was an easy, an easy yes. And my, yeah, my experience has been incredible. I've met, um, it definitely like life, life changing, uh, community, um, meeting, people already working in the field and pioneers like new, new, new folks like myself. Um, uh, and yeah, joining forces with just really brilliant and wise people. It's been great. Thank you so much. And I have learned so much from you during this year by just uh, being in the same study group as you are, as uh, it's been so valuable having you share about your experiences in Jungian analyst training and all of the insights that you've gotten from it. So I'm really looking forward to learning more during this hour. Um, so thank you. And then Ido Cohen, um, you have been a long-term collaborator with Cyclics Today, and uh, I actually interviewed you for the first time for my Jung course. I mean, I think this must be, must be like three years ago now. And since then, you've done a few podcasts with Kyle. Uh, do make sure to check them out. Uh, we'll put the links um, in the description. And also, you gave an amazing lecture just uh, a week ago at uh, for our vital program. So we're so happy to have you here. Would you mind going ahead and doing a little bit of an introduction for yourself? 
Thank you, Hannah. You're very kind. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Ido Cohen. I'm originally from Israel. For the last 12 years in Bay Area, California. Um, how did I get here? Uh, I got here because I remember being in undergrad and hearing about Jung for the second time and something just clicked. And long story short, I came here to go to California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, which is maybe one of the closest thing to Hogwarts that you can find. Um, a very integrative school that really, really gives psycho-spiritual education. And when I did my doctoral program, I was, I had this intention of studying change since I came back from India in my 20s. And I was told that change is too big of a topic and I have to choose one phenomena. And I thought, okay, what is the one phenomena that really shook my somatic, emotional, psychological, spiritual self, and it was ayahuasca. And in that moment, it was clear to me that I am going to study the integration process of ayahuasca ceremonies, but with Jung's perspective, which to my surprise, when I did my study, there was no other studies that looked into integration using a specific psychological lens, um, which was a good, it validated something for me. So. Yeah, um, graduate of CIS, work in the Bay Area with people with early childhood trauma, a lot of inner critic stuff, um, psycho-spiritual development, dreams. I'm very curious to read your dissertation, Mackenzie, when it's done. Um, I actually read yours, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and since part of what the dissertation birthed is my passion project, which is the integration circle, where we do a lot of uh, workshops and education around preparation and inter specifically integration and really getting to the nuances of how do we take psychedelic experiences and turn them into long-term sustainable change as opposed to just peak experiences and all that comes with that. And obviously, and I think we're going to go to it when we get into Jung, which is how the personal serves the collective and how the collectives serves the personal, which is a really important conversation. And I got here, I love collaborating with you, uh, with Psychedelics Today, You're my favorite education platform. I think the best education platform in psychedelics period right now. Um, in 2019, Kyle and I had this idea of doing a series on the shadow and really kind of breaking down what is shadow and what is it getting into the nuances and interviewing people from um, who have different roles and different functions in the psychedelic world. And in a very synchronistic way, we kept postponing it. It kept getting postponed. And we're like, okay, we'll release it in the winter because it's dark and people are introverted and they're in and it kept getting postponed. And literally as we were about, okay, let's release it, the pandemic hit. And I remember we both sat there and we're like, okay, this is not a coincidence. This is not a coincidence that this huge thing is happening. Everybody is locked at home and we just finished it right now. Um, So yeah, very excited to be here. Very excited to talk about this um, topic with you. Definitely, like you said, Johanna, always good to meet other nerds who are so much into this uh, and live it, not just talk it. So looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, let's hope that we can uh, um, carry over how the living and not just talking comes across because I think yeah. that's the big bridge to cross. Like how, how do we actually come Absolutely. from the theoretical to the lived embodied experience. So our subject for today is healing the healer. Psychedelic training includes shadow work and inner healing. And um, I think this is such a juicy subject to dive into because it really um, has such a fruitful point to start with from Jungian psychology as so much of it is about looking at ourselves and the sides of ourselves that we also wouldn't want to really look at. Um, but then also just the whole notion of the unconscious and the idea that, well, a lot of a lot of what we do and the way in we act is not really uh, decided by our conscious mind. 
But I think what the beauty of the Jungian psychology is that we can actually learn to navigate it and we can learn to work with it in ways where um, our lives become much more abundant and more beautiful and more synchronistic. And I think for myself, um, having studied psychology in the past and been so disenchanted with the fact that there was no Jung taught during my undergraduate, um, that now that I get to be at Vital and talk to people about Jungian psychology and it's important for myself is has been just so wonderful. So the first question <laughs> that I would like to ask you um, is really a question that I'm always trying to answer myself. So now I'm just looking forward to hearing what your <laughs> takes on this will be. And um, it is, why is Jungian psychology so relevant for integrating psychedelic experiences? And you can answer as briefly or as at length as you would like. <laughs> Kenzie, I'm going to let you start. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I can start if you want. I can start. No, I, uh, I'm happy to. Um, I, well, I'll start by saying I don't know why. I know that it is. That's like the most fundamental, the most fundamental thing I can say. And I know that it is. Um, I, I never intended to work in the psychedelic field. Um, I thought that that would be too cliche for a tattooed Californian to, to become a psychedelic psychotherapist and being the Aquarian and contra counter revolutionary human that I am. I was like, no, 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 can't buy into the cliches. And then it was like two years into um, analysis, more or less 18 months into my person, my training analysis here. Um, and I was sitting in analysis and I was talking about a dream and I was like in the process of talking about this dream, like uncovering this like deep soul childhood stuff and like lifetime stuff. And, and I had this very, very lived visceral experience of being on LSD. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is the same thing. The unconscious is the same, whether I'm dreaming it or tripping it or diving into it in myself in conversation and in the imaginal space. Wow. That's what Jung is that's what Jung's talking about. That's what psychedelics are and it was just this like one for one, you know, stars aligned like okay, that's why this is important because what Jung frames is the same th Jung modernizes the ancient Greek religion, the ancient Greek mythos, which is the process of encountering the archetypal reality, which is a psychedelic experience. Like when we have psychedelic experiences, we encounter a mythic reality and we need mythopoetic language to translate that reality. It doesn't exist on the rational plane. And Jung gave us that mythopoetic language for modernity. He didn't make it up. It, it, predates him by centuries. So when we're talking about psychedelics and the psychedelic experience, what we're talking about is accessing an experience that predates any one of us as individuals and predates all of our civilizations. And Jungian psychology is also that. So, so they're, they're, they need each other. Thank you. That's a, such a beautiful response and I couldn't have put it any better myself. Um, yeah, and what a lot of people don't really maybe know about Jung is that, yeah, indeed, he didn't invent really anything. A lot of his ideas were already there and came from the ancient Gnostics or Hermeticists or Alchemists. And uh, he just translated it into this mythopoetic language, which you were just men mentioning. Yeah, which yeah, is, was, I'm going to pick. He was a very go, good sorry, go ahead. Re, re, repackager. I think he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he did a really, really good job of, of rewrapping all, all the old tropes, which is such a huge skill, and I don't fault him for that at all. Certainly. So what do you think, Ido? Why is Jungian psychology so relevant for integrating psychedelic experiences? I think something you said when I was already 
starting my answer, which is I think he I think Yugi is a bridge translator. Although he didn't invent many of the things, I did, I, th I think he did invent the language that makes sense to the Western psyche, where these ineffable, either the psychotic or the psychedelic, can start making sense and can start we can start see how they belong, how we can create a relationship with them. And for me, that's where Jung is actually very relational, which is not talked a lot about in Jungian like. Um, communities like I remember doing in my postdoctorate in the Jung Institute here uh, it was a mission for them to become more relational which always made me curious I was like well th this is already really relational so what are we missing and I think a lot of it's because Jung has been really intellectualized right so archetypes are this intellectual idea as opposed to it's actually a very shamanic concept entity archetypes are entities but we'll get to that later um so I think he found the language. He found a language to explain the nuances of the psyche. I think he found a language to bridge between dimensions of experience, right? So the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, introverted, extroverted, um, the shamanic, the psychological. And he just found a way for us to start understanding how those two are related and they're not in opposition, right? Although there is tension, they're not in opposition. They actually complement each other. So something that can be ineffable, inconsistent, like I can't understand it or overwhelming, if I work with it over time using this consciousness map, it can actually start making sense to me and I can find a personal relationship to it. And we didn't have that language before him, right? So that's one really big thing for me. The other is I think he actually really normalized trauma. I think for me, Jung really normalized trauma in the sense that, yeah, we all have things that happen to us where aspects of our being of our psyche of our soul got splintered off and they went into our shadows but as opposed to and i would say that i'm i'm not a freudian so i don't want to diss freud but right freud's idea of your job is to become a um, satisfied neurotic jung is like no no behind your traumas behind your stuff there is actually the essence of life that you need to be who you truly are and I think that's a really big, big thing for us that when trauma is such a buzzword and buzz concept to really understand that trauma work is not about resolving a burden, but it's actually about re 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 reclaiming yourself, bringing yourself back in wholeness, which is actually very shamanic, right? In the indigenous cul cultures, they call it susto. That's like soul retrieval. You go back and you bring these aspects. So if soul is like two, a, two of a triggering word, then you can say you bring aspects of your personality, you bring aspects of your psyche, right? You bring aspects of yourself that have maybe kind of got left behind or frozen in time because of traumatic experiences or traumas that you've been through. Um, and lastly, I think he really helped us integrate the, the psycho-spiritual as, as in the means of there is a transpersonal archetypal reality, like Mackenzie said. And it's not just a woo-woo thing. It's not like only in California or in like isolated communities. And if you build a relationship with it, you can see that you are part of it, right? One of my favorite Jung quotes is, bidden or unbidden, God is always present. Like whatever your conception of God is, it's on, uh, oh, that's, that's committed, um, <laughs> right? But it's not just God here. It's not just God there. It's actually that it lives inside of you, right? you have a direct link and we can talk about the ego self access later but you have a direct link oh i want to jump in there because what you're saying about trauma i think is is part of that direct link you know Jung, jung's i can't remember where he says this but he says that every neurosis is an offended god hmm. <laughs> and i love that <laughs> Because it brings it, that's exactly this mythopoetic language, right? Like Hillman, Hillman's line um, that mythology is the psychology of antiquity, and psychology is the mythology of modernity. Um, so psychology is the mytho or mythology is the psychology of antiquity. That what that means is that the gods are aspects of the psyche. That we are seeing psychology, we are seeing the study of psyche in myth. 
And that's how psyche was handled, was in these stories. So if we talk about neurosis as being an individual psychological ailment, then, then we can understand how Jung would say it's an offended God. We've offended the mythical beings that govern our psyches, and we become neurotic in that offense. There's now an inner conflict. That's what a neurosis is. One part of me is in conflict with another, typically a conscious part in conflict with an unconscious part, and I become neurotic as a result. Um, so the, the healing of trauma, Peter Levine's line, um, something to the effect of, of trauma, is, there's, there's always an opportunity f to find God in your trauma, that all, all traumas are like the unrealized God. Um, and that, that piece of like, yeah, called or not called, God is there. Um, and in healing trauma, or in, or in being with our traumas, we can understand the power and the infinity of pain, of love, of fear. And that's godly. Like, that's massive. Humbling, which is what a god does, right? It humbles you. <laughs> when you're speaking, Mackenzie, I'm but just, just kind of... Truly, Yes. Yeah, yeah. The the realization I think of that is um, can be liberating when integrated, and yeah, that that's your work, right? Jung also mentions that mental illnesses of today can be thought of as as gods, and it's almost in the format in which we've sort of made ourselves to be so structured and uh, even put all of these different kinds of categories such as in like DSM about ways in which human soul operates in that I see that there's this kind of like th there's something mythological almost about that like about the way in which we are trying to conceptualize psyche at the moment and how that would have looked like for somebody like Jung and yes indeed he did mention that you know in the future it's like our mental illnesses are going to be operated as gods. Like we're going to be looking at them and thinking like, ah, oh, that is the, that is, you know, the deity that I worship. And if you think about the way in which people um, orient themselves towards their own, you know, different types of mental disabilities now, I think there is really something profound there because, yeah, we're, we're so lost. We don't have connection with that sort of mythological um base or our collective unconscious and I've always felt that th that is the big reason for why we feel the way we do as a society but there's just that great discrepancy between the way in which most of psychology operates today and that is why it's so interesting that psychedelics are now coming into the picture and we're in in a certain way we're trying to put it into the same narratives that we've had during the past hundred years whereas they they're not going to fit into that box. <laughs> they really won't. No, and, and, and I think we, we attempt to squeeze them into that box at our own peril. Like, it's a very dangerous game to, to try and apply psychedelics the same way that we've been applying Western, the Western medical model for treating psychological illness. We're, we're going to do ourselves a grave injustice if we continue to do that. Not to get doomsday -y, but... Um, another thing that uh, came up for me while you were talking, Ido, I was thinking about that notion of like how we indeed need to be so intimate with our own suffering and how Jung had this understanding of the, the certain kind of beauty and um, that can come with understanding one's own trauma. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to discuss is really the, this archetype of the healer and of wounded healer more specifically. So um, I would love for you both to just sort of say some words on how you think about the wounded healer or about the healer archetype in general. It's, it's interesting because I've seen in the last week, uh, Double Blind wrote a whole piece about that um, for what makes a psychedelic therapist and right. So what makes a healer? And then I saw two other big platforms like try to tackle that. I think even Psychedelics Today wrote something about that right now, like this week. So it seems like that archetype is really up. Um, the more we this world advances, um, 
I think for me, we need to start with actually looking in shamanic traditions. So if you think about Maria Sabina, if you think about Maria Sabina became who she became because she was hungry. She didn't have food and she was scavenging for, for mushrooms in the fort in, the, in Mexico. And then all of a sudden, as a four-year-old, she started having visions because she was eating the niños, the little children. And right there's an interesting thing in those traditions where you become a healer because you actually started with tending to your wound, not because you felt enlightened and like you have this like God-given gift necessarily. So uh, in a way, I think most healers start from their wound. Like how many therapists are out there, therapists, coaches are there because they were caretakers in their family because they've been listed to become the caretakers or had codependent like codependent relationships with their family because they needed to. I'm not saying all of us are that way, but some of us or most of us are that way. Um, so I think the wounded healer first is for me is the understanding that we're, you're, we're all humans, it means we all have wounds and we all have a healing capacity, right? So we all have the, the capacity to give to people, to provide service, but that doesn't mean that we finished our work, right? Part of why I love Jungian psychology is because Jung talks about individuation as a life until your last breath. So it's actually not a practice. If you think about it, individuation is an is a attitude towards your life. So you're never really done. There's never really being done, right? Um, so for me, the idea of the wounded healer is, right, a person that acknowledges everybody's humanity, their own humanity, sees the necessity for doing this work in a continuous manner. And I think in a way, then healing becomes a form of seeing reality. It's a way you interact with reality, right? And we can break down what healing actually means because that word is thrown around and what does it actually mean anymore? And is it a process? Is it an outcome? Who knows anymore? Um, and there is something of, for me, in being a healer is a very deep sense of commitment. You have to be, it's devotion, right? In Shapibo Kunibo lineage, for example, you have to train for at least seven years before you serve anyone medicine. And we're talking rigorous training where you at least for one year sit alone in a tumbo in the jungle communicating with all these invisible forces and nature and you have to survive and right and it's like it's a devotion you have to really go through the gates of initiation until you get to a place where you're like okay now you can really start working on your own and go out and um which i think is part of what i would do in translate to the western wounded healer which is we're trying to bypass a lot of that so I just wrote a post about spiritual bypass and the last piece is I wrote is the very, it's the very wounded healer, which is people who have big psychedelic experiences or entheogenic experiences and they get very inspired and they connect with this archetype. But this is where Jung is understanding complexes is really important because inspiration and seeing your potential, but maybe potential or being inspired to be of service does not automatically make you a healer. Hmm. It's the, the, just the seed being planted inside the soil of your being. And from that moment, you're like, okay, I came out with that experience. What does that mean? And how do I start tending to this thing? And I think there is a wounding. So as far as the wounded healer, if we want to go to the like more shadowy part of it, is seeing that it takes a long time. And not let our inspiration and our good intentions come in the way of devotion, of training, of what I think is basically an anti-capitalistic idea of like not everything comes fast and not everything comes easy, right? Vital is a year-long program, a very rigorous year-long program. It's not six months, it's not three months, right? And you're bringing all these, now that I'm trying to use Vital as like a an advertisement for Vital, but I think it's a great example of how you're bringing all these people who are experts to give their expertise, right? So part of being a, a healer is learning from people who have a lot more experience than you. Learning in community. 
So you're not just sitting isolated in your home with a book or on your computer and you're learning and nobody can reflect things to you or there's no bouncing of ideas or there's no that interpersonal connection of like, oh, all these things are coming up for me. Um, so I think that, so I think it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't have anything to add at the moment, but. I want to pick up a couple of threads from that, that like, um, I don't think that there is a healer without the, without the wounded part. Like I think healer is necessarily a wounded healer. Um, and perhaps that's a polemic thing to say, but, um, yeah, we're not, we're not healed. Rather, we, we are not qualified to heal another until we have healed ourselves, right? This is Hippocrates thing, physician, heal thyself. Um, and part of why I think that's the case um, is because suffering and compassion are inextricably linked. We, can ha we cannot have compassion unless we have suffered. Um, and if we're going into being a healer under the auspices of, I have something that this wounded person doesn't, we've already created a power imbalance in which healing cannot happen. So the woundedness is necessary because now I'm your equal. I'm just as fucked up and just as human as you. I've made all the mistakes. I've seen all the shadow. I've fallen on my face again and again and again, and I'm still standing. And that's why I can help you. Not because I'm coming at you from a privileged place of better than, right? Like compassion only exists between equals and we can't heal without compassion. We can't see another person without compassion. So so the the unwounded healer the person that's altruistically of service that has not actually felt their pain and that's all it means to be wounded all of us is wo are wounded like you said ito every single person is carrying wounds that doesn't necessarily mean that you've suffered them right jung has this whole thing about legitimate suffering that we need to legitimately suffer in order to come to consciousness there needs to be genuine pain in order to come to consciousness and without that, if I just like give lip service to the trauma that I've lived through, but I don't actually feel it, then the humbling hasn't happened and I can't be your equal. I'm only ever always above you, better than you, because my intellect will always find a way to make me bigger, brighter, smarter, whatever, right? But like heart to heart, I need to be your equal if there's actually going to be a space that, that healing happens and for that space like yeah i need to just be human and flawed and wounded um and of course like we also can't be with people's pain if we're still running from our own uh and i see this with anna Zans because the universe is a magical synchronistic place. It, I, I've, I've had this experience more times. Like this is, this is now the normal where I will have some new heartbreak, some fresh grief, some like, like, uh, and all like be in it. And then three, four clients that week will come to me like with that exact same thing and like that's always been true for them and it's always been true for me and we've been working together for months or years but it wasn't conscious for me and therefore it wasn't conscious for them and now that i can hold it in myself i can hold it with them and they can hold it in themselves like the depth of the room is the depth of the of the room um so the healer is the is the container in which the darkness can like come forward and if we haven't dealt with our own pain and our own darkness then somebody else's doesn't have safety to to exist i i love that i'm gonna pick up on that i love that idea mackenzie of the healer is the container and i think it's that's where actually experience is important in the sense that i don't know more than you but if i went very deep inside of myself if i trained rigorously if i did my own experiences 
And that doesn't mean that I've said in a thousand ayahuasca ceremonies, because I know people who said in 300, but learned very little from them. But it provides this space where you can then feel consciously or unconsciously safe to let go. And then stuff can happen. Because someone has to, I, I'm a very, I'm Marion Woodman fan, for those who don't know her. And she talks about the container all the time. She's like, someone always has to hold the container. Sometimes it's the therapist, sometimes it's the patient, sometimes it's God, sometimes it's someone else. But someone always has to hold for things to actually happen. And the other thing you're making me think about is maybe it is important for us to break down suffering. Um, at any time I talk, I talk about Calshed's, Donald Calshed's book, Trauma and the Soul, which I think is a must for anyone who's in this world. Agreed. And he communicate something that Freud kind of talked about, which is there is authentic suffering and there is neurotic suffering, right? Neurotic suffering is when we suffer something, but we stay in the same place. What does it mean? There is no new insight. There is no new information. There is no new sensation. There is no new process, right? So basically you're breaking your leg and you're just walking around with a broken leg. Authentic suffering is when you go, you develop, like you're saying, relationship with that. Why am I hurting today? Oh, it's about my mother and my father. Okay, but why today? What is coming up today that this is coming up for me? Can I go deeper into the suffering? Can I understand it deeper? And I always say this, you can break your leg and keep it broken. You can break your leg and go into a cast. It's the same pain, but one is going to heal, the other is going to stay broken. Right? So I think it's important that we don't glorify suffering every we're all suffering and we all move between the two but that there is again this is the normalization of trauma for me it's like yes we're all suffering and suffering is scary and shadow is scary and it can overwhelm us and it takes it takes time and there is this thing where we can build a relationship with it it's all about the relationship and i find yeah i love this authentic versus neurotic suffering like uh, I'm sure everybody, well, maybe not everybody, most of you who are listening have a family member who complains all the time and does absolutely nothing to change. I see this a lot in couples work. There's usually one person in the dyad who is desperate for change and doing absolutely everything, all of the self-investigation, all of the attachment wounding stuff, all of the like behavioral interventions, and then the other one's like, this is just the way I am. And both of them are in an equal amount of pain, but one of them is neurotically suffering and one of them is trying to authentically suffer. Trying to work through the suffering to make some change, right? And, and that's, the neuro that's the neurosis. That's the like, I won't change because I don't know what's on the other side of this change and it's easier to stay in the familiar even if I'm suffering. So I'll complain about it. I'll get people onto my team, but I'm not actually going to do the scary work of feeling and transforming, like the alchemical work, um, which I totally get. Uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's incredibly common. And yeah, that's kind of this, like you can have consciousness of being wounded without feeling the woundedness, right? And like, this is another thing that Marion Woodman talks, talks so much about is the loss of the feeling function in the West that we have completely lost the ability to just be with the feeling, to just hold in the container of our body a sensation, a feeling, until it moves through us and transforms. And it, and it will inevitably transform us, and that's kind of part of our resistance to it, I think, is intuitively we know, wow, if I let this feeling in, if I let this fear in, if I let this grief in, I'm going to emerge on the other side different. Shit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I want to make sure that we're not, I think most of it is because, Johanna, you talked to this, that we don't live in a culture that educates and prioritizes that. And most of us don't grow up in families where we get to be held in our suffering in a healthy, ongoing, consistent way. And that fuels this thing. Right. So let alone capitalism, and I'm not dissing capitalism. There's a lot of beautiful things about it, but the shadow of it is like move, move fast, instant coffee. Right. That's the shadow of psychedelics. Okay, come on. 
three sessions, one you weekend. Can take a psychedelic without the trip now. Exactly. <laughs> I, I was just talking about it yesterday with someone who <laughs> was I never heard of it, and I could see the face of horror. Um, right? Or you can go in a weekend, or go into this, or here is this shortcut to end your suffering. That is a menta- That is a what is behind this is actually is despair. It's despair. It's playing into human despair. We know that you're suffering, and here's the shortest way out of your suffering without you having to feel the pain. That doesn't exist. And that leads me to something we there was in the questions, which is about what is actually shadow and what is shadow work. And maybe we can kind of slowly go into that because having your symptom reduced is not the same thing as having your as doing shadow work. Yeah, indeed. And that's and- a big confusion in this world that we are talking about. Oh, and, and especially when, when it comes to psychedelics. And I haven't yet read your article on spiritual bypassing, but I would absolutely love to. Um, because I think a lot of people do have a lot of misconceptions around this notion of the shadow and what the shadow work really means. And um, can we really just like go get to know our shadow intimately by sitting in like 100 ayahuasca ceremonies or... Um, should we maybe just like go visit our siblings instead? I mean, it's just like, I think the shadow just really like lives in places where people really don't anticipate it. And because we now have access to this, um, uh, oftentimes rather immediate access to unimaginable worlds, um, just just something that's completely unfathomable for people who would have lived like, say, 50, 60 years ago, um, the things that we can experience on a day-to-day basis. I think a lot of people have really become um, just dis- disillusioned with the way in which we actually do self-development or however you want to describe it as. Um, so, yes, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about this, like, how do you see the shadow and what do you really see as being shadow work? Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, yeah, the shadow I think is kind of a misnomer um, because, well, I don't know. Maybe it's a misnomer. Well, let's go with that. It's a misnomer. Um what that essentially means, like sh- Jung's Jung's always working in in c- compensation, right? That like the the psyche ha- is a, has a it's psychodynamic, and the dynamic of the psyche is that it's always compensating for itself. So anywhere that it is imbalanced or one sided, there is always a compensatory energy somewhere in the unconscious trying to balance it. The shadow is what compensates for the persona. The persona is the mask. It's the forward facing part of ourselves. It's the socialized part of ourselves. So as we grow, we are well socialized to fit into our cultural container and succeed by whatever definitions our culture determines equal success, right? In order to succeed, most of us need to sacrifice a fair amount of our individuality because success looks by nature of society, right? Society as a, as a unit has no individuals. Eric Neumann's great line, the individual is the greatest threat to society. I love that because society homogenizes. That's the way that societies stay safe. And I'm living in one of the, the most homogenized places in the world right now and I see it. It's so safe and it's so clean and it's insane. It's like, it's maddening. Because, because the individuality is like just sucked right out of the room. Um, oops. Um, so persona is the well-adapted, well-socialized face of us. And it's a mask. It's only ever always a mask. We often will adopt a persona before we're conscious of its mask quality, of its inauthentic quality. And so we're very identified with it. Until we become conscious of it, we're fully merged with it. The shadow necessarily grows inside of us in the unconscious to compensate for this inauthentic part. So the shadow then becomes this incredible, thank God it exists, container for everything that is authentic and unique 
to us. But because society has taught us to fear that individuality, we'll no longer succeed, we'll be ostracized, we'll be shunned, we'll lose the tribe, like all of our biological programming from millennia of evolution, right, are against this individuality. And because of that, the shadow has taken on this really negative um, sheen. Like, it's hard for people to, to just walk up to the shadow and be like, cool, so glad to meet you, right? We, we project onto it the same things that society has projected onto our individuality, which is that it's unsafe, it will lead to ostracization, um, will be shunned, will be humil humiliated, all of which may be true. Like there's, there is some truth to that, depending on how, how um, intense a society or how uniform of, of a society you live in. Um, so shadow work is the process of A, letting go of the persona, disidentifying with this mask. And in order to do that, we actually need to do some healthy ego work, right? Like that's actually the first step of shadow work is who am I if I'm not this image? Who am I if I'm not satisfying everybody's needs and ex expectations of who I'm supposed to be? That's ego work. And that's essential before we do shadow work because we need an uh, we need an orientation within ourselves, a point of reference to then relate to the shadow with, um, from. And then the shadow work is, wow, if I hadn't been socialized in this way, if I wasn't enculturated in this way, if I didn't have such a chip on my shoulder to do what daddy told me to do, if I didn't hate my mom so much, if I wasn't in competition with my sister so much, like whatever the inner society of family or the outer society was, who would I have been? What are the gifts, talents, strengths, fears, longings, desires, lusts that I repressed to hide my individuality from the world? So that's shadow work. I think. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, yeah. I, I have, you know, that, that was great. Oh yeah. I have uh, it's like a whole <laughs> mycelium light bulb up in here. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess I would want to break it down. I think, right. So for those who don't know Jung, right. So there's two levels to consciousness and cause Mackenzie just took us really deep inside. There is the personal and collective, right? Personal and conscious is all the things that are related to our personhood, right? So it can be the, so the cultures I lived in, the society, my family, my interactions. And the way I understand shadow is shadow is everything that is out of the light of our consciousness. So like you said, McKenzie, right? There is what we call in the Jungian world, negative shadow. And in the post-Jungian world, there is a golden shadow. So there's all these things that you don't even know about yourself that are deeply authentic about you that is also lurking in the shadows, right? But they're blocked, uh, they're unconscious, they're stuck because of certain things. So the personal shadow, right, is all of our traumas, our experiences, things that were shamed in us, things that were rejected in us, um, experiences of the collective we had, like a war, for example, and what it did to us. That's all, and it's too much to bear. I think that's why I want to really humanize it. It's too much to bear. Somatically, emotionally, psychologically, it's too much. So in a healthy way, what does the psyche do? It sends it to the unconscious. It's a healthy coping mechanism. But what happens when we don't deal with it is that it becomes dissociation, it becomes symptoms if we continuously feed the repression, right? And what does that mean? It means something comes up, I look at it. I literally did a session yesterday with someone mm. who is preparing for an ayahuasca ex uh, experience. And he was talking about having serious distrust and that it, it gives him this hypervigilance about work. So he's constantly preoccupied with work and it's disconnecting him from his partner. And it said, if we think about events that can that are related to distrust, what comes up for you? And he sat there and he's like, oh, my father left my mom when I was 21 in a day and it changed our life forever. And he said something so interesting. He's like, and he started laughing. I was like, what's going on? He's like, well, it was right here when you asked me, but I kept looking, about, he literally did this. I kept looking for something else. That's 
a, a version of an ambivalent relationship with shadow. So, right. So you let something like Mackenzie, you said, we let the feeling come up. We let the sensation come up and we are curious with it. We don't automatically try to do something with it. So that's the level of the personal. And then there's the collective unconscious, right? Greed, rage, racism, genocide, the shadow of capitalism, oppression, um, how we, I was just about to say toxic masculinity, how we talk about women's bodies, what we do with, right? Like what, how we talk about masculinity and what does it mean to be a man? And what does it mean to be a woman? And all of these layers and that are being perpetrated on all of us that we should think is who we are, or we should, a uh, standard we should all strive for, right? So that's how the collective unconscious shows up and then they're related, right? So if I go down the street and I constantly see commercials of, as a woman of like, oh, you should be this type of size and you wear this type of thing and look like this, it leaks inside and it becomes my personal shadow. And then you can start writing big examples. It's like then eating disorders start or can start, body dysmorphia, low self-esteem, right? All these things. But yeah, and I really appreciate that you brought healthy ego, because I think that's really important. There is this desire, I think, in the psychedelic community to kill your ego, murder your ego. And I want to talk about it in a minute. But so for me, there's e there is shadow encounter, which is I am seeing something for the first time. Oh my God, here's this trauma. Or, oh my God, I thought I was supposed to be a businessman, but actually I want to be a first grade teacher because it gives me fulfillment, all right? Whatever shade that has, or something that you know, but you re-encounter in an experience. And you can feel it, you can sense it in your body, you can have a vision about it, you can interact with an archetype, whatever that looks like. But that's just first encounter. Shadow work for me is you build an ongoing relationship with it. You let your body sense it after the experience. You let your feelings come up. You let your mind tell you the story of like, oh, right? So let's use this example from yesterday. When we started talking about his father leaving, there was a whole story there that fuels a very, very alive anxiety about in the present, but it leaks into my work life. So I, and we, and right, letting the story tell itself. So that's shadow work for me. And that's the relational piece, right? That means about, I have to develop a relationship. And if I want to go deeper, I'll go to Mackenzie and she will help me develop an even deeper relationship. With it. And why is that important? Because it means that then Mackenzie, let's say I grew up with a very, very, um, neglectful, when, when not critical mother, at some point, Mackenzie will become that mother and I get to work on it in the moment, not as an intellectual concept, right? So this is where archetypes come to life and this is where possessions happen. So I'm going to be the child and Mackenzie is going to be my mom and we get to work on it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that's the, that's the psychology of the transference, right? And that's, that's, a lot of, of what an analytical container is attempting to elicit um, is some kind of transference dynamic where the pattern can be healed by being interrupted because the human relationship element changes, that I am not the neglectful mother. I'm Mac, I'm me, and I'm going to relate to you as me. And you get to have that experience of feeling neglected for a moment because of the machinations of your own mind, realizing, oh my God, this is all in my head, dropping down underneath it and coming to a fresh, coming to the human relationship with fresh eyes. Um, and that process takes the time that it takes. Um, but I wanted to like to the, the, the cultural shadow thing. This is such a phenomenal, I don't know, we're in, we're in a really interesting moment right now. Um, we're, I mean, we're always in an interesting moment with cultural shadow. Uh, <laughs> when is the shadow not totally fascinating? <laughs> but the, what I'm, Judeo-Christian ethics, right? Good versus evil. Um, have been, that's been the zeitgeist for 2000 years, that there is a good 
there is a moral way of being and there is evil and there is an immoral way of being and one is heaven and one is hell. Um, what that, that unconscious um, equation has set us up for is that unless I am perfect, I am bad. In, and therein is the shadow, right? So perfection is a really, really wonderful way of saying what the shadow is not. One of my favorite pithy lines of Jung's is that the shadow is the fly in the ointment. The unconscious is the fly in the ointment. And he, he talks about um, a particular bird whose name I forget that like its song doesn't complete the note. So you hear this bird and in your mind, you're like, ah, ah, something is supposed to exist here that doesn't exist. And he talks about it as like, that's nature because nature is a perfect representation of how the unconscious is. It's unfinished. It's in process. It's not perfect. It's human consciousness and our striving, our egoic persona driven striving that have us believe that we can be perfect, AKA not human, AKA have no shadow. So the shadow is, is this part of the unconscious that is, it's the frills, it's the weirdness, it's the awkward pauses, it's the burps and the, and the disgusting stuff and the repulsion and also like the, the quirks, the idiosyncrasies, the, um, in Swiss German, they, they talk about the, um, a square that's missing a corner. It's the missing corner that you need, you need to have a piece missing so that life can live there. Like that's natural. Um, and this Judeo-Christian idea of like morally good and therefore perfect and everything else needs to be banished to hell. That's the, that's the enculturation that all of us in the West have grown up with, whether or not we were raised religious. Like it's just, it's in our hero myths, right? Um, but we're in this moment, I think culturally, where that that bubble is starting to burst and people are starting to say, hey, my gender's not perfect. My sexuality's not perfect. It doesn't align with your standards. My story's not perfect. It's full of trauma. My brain's divergent, right? Like, and that's actually becoming, that's like a lauded thing. We're privileging these people. And I, I don't mean privilege in the heavy negative way, but like these stories are coming out and we're saying, oh my God, right. It's not perfect. There are so many ways of being that are idiosyncratic and have a piece missing and don't complete the last note. And thank God that neurodivergence, that gender divergence, that, that trauma history um, is of such great benefit. So, so that's a piece about cultural shadow that just feels really like lovely right now mm -hmm. that we're actually starting to really embrace um, weirdness. I, I really Co appreciate it. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just love the fact that you brought up this uh, Christian mythology because Jung spoke about it a lot. And uh, I just found this quote from Marie-Louise von Franz earlier today, which I would like to share with you both. Um, it's very brief. The Christian myth does not include the dark feminine, treats matter as dead and does not face the problem, problem of the opposites of evil. Alchemy faces the problem of the opposites, faces the problem of matter and faces the problem of the feminine. So I guess in here, it's like there is that it's it is also the dark feminine that has been missing for God knows how long, 2000 years at least um, from the sort of uh, cultural container and i think in my opinion it's it's quite hard to talk about these things but that includes all of that sort of predictability and what jung also described as nature and the sort of quirkiness and um all of the things that cannot really be put into a box and are sort of unpredictable by a sense because they are chaotic and we tend to label those things all as feminine for one reason or another but i think there is something to that definition as well absolutely uh, go ahead, go ahead you know. well i'll just like quickly the the one one important thing i think with um shadow and the feminine the dark feminine we're talking here about instinct Jung, Jung 
one of one of his other great um, compensatory things is is intellect versus instinct, right? Or like the instinctual self versus versus the spiritual self. Um, and in the West, where we've sanitized everything through rationality, we he calls it the cult of consciousness. We've become so conscious, i.e., driven by our conscious ideals that we've lost the dark feminine, to, to use Marie-Louise von Franz's word, but that means that we've lost the instinctual body. Like the actual, I say lusts, but I don't mean sex. I mean hunger. I mean like impulse for more life. And it's never sated, Primal. but that's a good thing because it's that lack of satisfaction that drives evolution to keep going. I'm going to follow the instinct, follow the impulse for more life in this direction, in this direction, in this direction. And without that, I'm just striving for a more perfection ideal, right? It's just more of the machination of my mind without that like instinctive body that's like, ah, oh, yes, or like, oh, no. Right? Exactly. And just one thing, if, you know, I uh, I would love for you to hear your ideas on this, but it's just like that's how it's been misconceptualized as a cultural shadow. It's like gone into the shadow of our culture and it's become like the idea of the feminine has become kind of perverted um, where there is actually lies dormant this uh, such uh, instinctual power in it and I'm just thinking like Clarissa Pinkola as this woman who run with the wolves like that book was like so foundational for a lot of women to understand like oh that's what it is like that's why I feel the way I do and I think Jungian psychology I mean she's you know also a Jungian in a sense um, gives language to it but yeah Ido I would love to hear your thoughts on this I no, I, I love both of what you're saying I, I'm it feels important to say that, you know, when we talk about for people who are not very um, intimate with this world, feminine and masculine is have nothing to do with genders. So let's degender it. It can might as well have been called blue and green, just landing in those two words. Um, and I think the big thing when I hear you both is that I'm hearing fear, right? This is the, the banishment of the feminine came because of fear and because of fear of the, of what Mackenzie was saying, which is feminine is for me, as I understand it, is process. It has no goal. You can't put it in a box. It's the ongoing spiral that is life where we keep doing things over and over, right? Like what brings people a lot to psychedelics or there is a tra uh, an interesting phenomenon in ketamine where people come, I've heard a lot of ketamine providers say, people come to me and the first thing they say is, I tried everything and nothing is working. Right? What is that? It's suffering. So there's, but it's also behind it, there is this idea of the masculine, which is, well, you got something that's going to get me to my goal. All of them come out disappointed because they realize, oh, my, they might have new insight. They're like, oh, this is going to take me years to unpack. There is no escaping this thing. There's only going down deeper, down and down and down and down. And it brings the question of how much that punishing God, as I call it, that you were talking about, Mackenzie, which is I humanize it for myself in my work as we all have an inner critic. That's the, like the embodiment of the punishing God. Everybody has a, an inner critic that they inherited from something or from someone. That's the, the like humanized version of the punishing God and how much that instills fear in us that then banishes the feminine. I can't be messy, right? I work now with a bunch of men who are were bred to be good American boys. Like that's their archetype. And the word we keep using is what it would like to be messy. Can you make a mistake? Is it okay to not be perfect? And the intolerable, here's the feminine, the intolerable feelings that even that idea brings up in them. What are you talking about me connecting with the messy, like the feminine? That's tolerable. Like what will happen to me? But that's the whole thing about masculinity and how that's been banished for men inside of men. But what I do want to bring up, I'm going to have my own agenda, which is how is that related to this concept of ego death? And I think it is related. I think it's related to this idea that this, what I would call a masculine idea, that the ego is one our source of suffering. If I can kill it, I will never suffer again. 
right? So it gets confused with enlightenment. And I think that's Jungian ideas are really great because as I understand it, and McKinsey and John, please jump in, is the ego is nothing more than your synthesizer. It's the thing that takes information and synthesize it. So it's the thing that actually helps you wake up in the morning and brush your teeth. Because you've learned that you have to wake up in the morning and brush your teeth. If not, your teeth will fall out. Right? And somehow, somewhere in history, it became the source of all evil. And the psychedelic renaissance is playing right into that trap. Ego death, ego death. And I'm going to say something, and that's my personal opinion. People who are listening, some of them will like it, some of them not. That's a false myth that is rooted in despair and avoidance of being human. There is no ego death. You can have ego disidentification. You can release the center of your consciousness from their ego, but you will never kill your ego and you shouldn't want to kill your ego. If you're going to kill your ego, who's going to be home to integrate? Where are you going to take all these beautiful experiences? Who's going to synthesize them and alchemize them for you? And how much that is a way in which we're banishing the feminine, which is process. Which is, yes, being in my body and suffering. Because there is also so much beauty in suffering. Because if you can't be in your body to suffer, you're not going to be in your body and experience love. And they work together. I worked with a man who came from a very war, he was from Bosnia, and he came to me after he had an LSD experience. And he said, listen, it's the first time in my life that I have felt fear. He said, I grew up next to bombs. I've had people hold guns to my head. I had to jump out of planes and do extreme sports just to feel anything. Three sessions afterwards, he came and he's like, as he was going back from the States to Bosnia, he said, I have to tell you something really weird. I was like, sure, what's happening? He said, my wife has told me that since this experience, she has never experienced me as loving as she had in the last three weeks. And he was like, do you think that my ability to be afraid and my ability to love are connected? And I was like, of course they are. If you banish one, you're banishing the opposite. And if you think, and that's, so I'm very curious because I see the nodding and I see you, Mackenzie, thank you for the, the silent cloud. But I'm very curious to hear your, your both thoughts about that. Because it's super I, I, important I, to talk about. It's super important. I tell my clients all the time and they hate me for it, um, that grief, grief is the price of entry. You, you will not get into this circus, this carnival, this ride of life until you feel your fucking grief. It is the price of entry. And you do not get to determine how big the grief is. It is as big as it's going to be. For some of us, it's a little bit. For some of us, it's bucket loads for years. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, man. Wish I could have chosen a different life, but no, I don't know, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I know I signed up for this and I'm fully here for it. Um, so yes, I fully agree. Like I think um, what the what I understand Jung to mean by the cult of consciousness or the over the over rationalization, this this hyper dependence on rationality is is precisely this, you know, that like we're not suffering we're not feeling it doesn't even need to be suffering we're not feeling because feeling is irrational it's process it's not progress there's no goal there's no destination so so i rationalize it away because it's not serving my conscious goals um but in so doing i'm i i we don't realize that we're banishing all of the parts that make life meaningful too like we're in a meaning crisis. Suicide is the fourth largest cause of death um, because we don't have the capacity to feel the feelings that would make life on earth matter. Joy. And I mean, even grief, right? Grief is an indication of how much you've loved something. But love, contentment, peace, like all of these are feelings. They're not ideas. <laughs> They're not these like illusory things that you can't access because you don't understand them well enough. You can't access them because you're not 
feeling anything at all. Uh, that's the cult of consciousness. I'm so rational that I have no feeling. Um, and this is like so essential for psychedelic work, right? Because of course, like your client, when we have a psychedelic experience, I don't know anybody that has an unemotional psychedelic experience. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> then there's dissociation and trauma, but right. I mean, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. You can you, you can have a you can have a numb experience, but you can be becoming conscious yeah, yeah. of your numbness, yeah. um, which is very different. Uh, and there are, of course, ways in a psychedelic session, if numbness is coming up, to bypass the, 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 the brain's pharmacy and get underneath the, the opioid receptors. But that's a different conversation. But, like, becoming conscious of be having been numb your whole life, that's a huge thing. That's, not, that's, not, that's no small thing. And the, like, for those of us that do have these cathartic emotional experiences... I mean, yeah, what, I, what I've come to many times with psychedelics is that it can be a one second experience, but it is infinity in, in its verticality, like the depth of sadness or the depth of joy, the depth of anger that I felt in a very, very, very limited amount of chronological time is, is deep enough to be infinite, right? And so psychedelics actually unlock for most of us this feeling function, this place of deep, deep feeling. And if we then come back with our rational minds after we've sobered up and try to understand that with rationality or try to sanitize it with the tools of Western, um, our Western enculturation by saying we need to take away the pain, then we are not, then there's no point in the psychedelic. Like if all you're doing is trying to take away the pain, um, don't do psychedelics. Like, just, just don't. There, there, there are other medicines. There are other paths. Um, there's a, uh, I have this quote actually over my desk and it's really my favorite quote. She says, what makes it unbearable is your mistaken belief that it can be cured. What makes it unbearable is your mistaken belief that it can be cured. So the illegitimate suffering, the neurotic suffering, is me I, attaching to the idea that someday I will live without this. Nope. You probably won't. Like, if you're in a body, things are gonna hurt. You're gonna lose people. Sometimes it's gonna be great. Sometimes it's gonna be awkward. It's not gonna be cured though. There's no cure to the human condition. <laughs> Death. So much to uh, <laughs> death, right? <laughs> yeah, death is the cure. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, there's so much richness in what both of you are saying, and so many tangents that we could go down on. Um, but yeah, I guess what I wanted to bring up is just from both what you were saying, you know, about this idea of ego and then what you were saying, Mackenzie, about the importance of really feeling um, is this that this is what I really love about Jung's idea of individuation. And it brought so much comfort for me um, when I first started sort of having psychedelic experiences, but also studying like ways to conceptualize it, um, that there is no need to just completely become like have a lot lose yourself in the experience but it's actually about becoming more you in a sense and just like little by little we get to reclaim a bit more of our sort of uniqueness and I think that idea is just really wonderful and I obviously I have nothing against people wanting to use different frameworks for it like and I mean where this whole notion of ego loss com comes from is the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the um, this manual that was written by Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert and Houston Smith back in the 60s so obviously they had a lot of experiences which f fit into this conceptual framework that corresponded more to Eastern mysticism but what I always loved about Jung's writing and about his approach is that there's a certain kind of softness and humanness to it and that we will be flawed and and but we will go onwards and and uh, that it's it's okay you know and he, like you said Mackenzie like there's no point 
to think that you're just going to be cured one day and that then there is just going to be this like perfect existence on some like a little cloud where you will feel no pain of any kind of so um yeah i just and want I think to what you're you saying Johanna, is is really important and for integration and why jungian theory is so important for integration right one of my favorite jung quotes is from one of his least known books which drives me nuts uh, which calls the integration of personality where he says the last that whatever no matter how big your experience is in the integration is you're supposed to take the pieces that feel incomprehensible and see that they actually inside of them there are the pieces that are supposed to make what's unwhole whole and it will better your life and that's integration and that's where I think that like how all this stuff that we're talking about actually is really important for psychedelics because all this is great. And if you don't build the bridge after, all these things are going to go away. And I see this so many times. People have really potentially life altering experiences that can really change their life. And after the two week sparkle period, if there is no practice, if there is no container, like Mackenzie said, it will fall apart because there's so much pressure on the psyche to go back to conformity, to go back to work. I have to go back into my relationship, but it's not about that. I have to go back to the version of self I was that went to work before I went to the jungle or sat and did a psychedelic session with Johanna or whatever that is. And without containers, so it's containers both therapy, right? It's also community. So like integration circles, it's your friends who are into this. It's maybe mentors that you have who are into this. It's online communities. The integration falls apart. So, and that's where there's the loss of how do we build these, I call them like micro steps, right? So it's, you take one step and then you put both feet in it. So you have to be embodied. And then you take another step and then you put, put feet in that. And integration is not just, I separate it from myself, that integration is not just tools. Yeah, you can journal from now until three days in a row. But if you're not actually in your process, if you're not bringing your experience to the moment and you're journaling, you're just writing words. If I go to nature as an integration practice, but I'm going to nature and all I'm thinking about is the emails I have to answer, how my girlfriend is annoying, how my partner is like doing this, how I'm tired of this world. You're not integrating, you're ruminating, right? So the intention is important. So there's integration tools. And I think where Jung is really good or Jungian is really good, it's the internal, the more introverted experience, which is like we've been saying, the feelings, that's our big theme of today, but also our sensations. What sensations did you have in your experience? What happens if you re-embody them? I just did a thing that, I'm, that's why I'm curious about your dissertation. I just did a thing, I'm doing this series for a group about how we use dreams that are coming up as people are doing long plant diets. And we just did a whole thing about working with the body. And we had an incredible session where people are like, ah, I don't know about this. And we just had them bring a sensation or a posture from their dream and a whole universe exploded. So that's how union psychology is actually really applicable. And of course, archetypal world. Oh, great, you were swallowed by a serpent on your journey. Wonderful. Okay, let's, let, what is this serpent? How does it, how did it feel to be in interaction with this serpent? Right, what are your serpent associations? And then just the beginning and then opening it up and amplifying it and go hang out with a bunch of snakes and touch them and feel them if you want to take it to the next level, but. I want to point out that like all of these exercises that you're, you're talking about here, you know, and like these ways of being with unconscious content that emerges, um, d like requires a healthy ego to come back to the, your question that I didn't address around like ego death. Um, you know, the way that we talk about ego in the psychoanalytic framework is that ego is the vantage point. Um, it's, it's my Archimedean point for me. That doesn't mean that it's not essential for me to sometimes not stand at that vantage point, right? I need to get outside of myself, see myself from the outside. And that's maybe what the ego death experience offers is that if I become too rigid, too calcified in my perspective, 
too separate in, in my relationship to other, because that's the other thing that the ego is, right? For me to exist, there needs to be an other. So it necessitates separation. And that separation is essential for relationship. You can't have relationship if you're merged. There's no relational dynamic with merging, right? So the ego is essential for any kind of relationship. That means relationship to inner content as much as it means relationship to outer world phenomena. Absolutely. And what you're talking about, Ida, with integration is that you take that vantage point of here I am. And now I will relate to this memory, this experience from my ayahuasca, this snake that came up in my dream, this body posture of the dream character that I had, but I'm doing so from the vantage point of me and therefore relating to it as a separate other. This is the other, this is the individual, but the ego death experience. And I completely agree. Like it's, it's literally a suicide mission. I mean, by definition, right? But like, it's it's um, so dangerous that we are sending people on this kamikaze mission. And by we, I mean, like spiritual teachers and gurus. I can't tell you how many people have come into my consulting room, having listened to some online guru, read some um, non-dual teachings, gone and done like a blast off dose of 5-MeO DMT. And then two years later, they're like, I still can't pick up the pieces. Who am I? Please help. And perhaps they've come into my room because that was also me. Like this was my, this was my work of psychedelic integration was like going way, way, way too far down the rabbit hole of enlightenment and non-duality to the point of absolute breaking and like psychosis. Um, and that's, of course, what happens when we don't have a vantage point. If, if there is no individual self, then you are all selves at all times. And there's no Archimedean point at which you can stand to relate to the world. Um, so that like this healthy ego work of differentiating from inner figures, from others. But then then, of course, the tension is and this is like life is life is such a dance it's never one thing right i can't just do the work of differentiating at some point i'm gonna have to the pendulum's gonna have to swing to the other side and i'm gonna have to do the work of merging again like i'm gonna have to become porous and flexible again and that's like what the healthy ego idea is right that a healthy ego is a flexible ego i don't need to exist i know that i do exist it doesn't need to be my perspective i know that i can take a perspective if i need to um, yeah. And, and I mean, like just this, I don't know, there's something about perspectival thinking here that feels really important. And this is why mythology is so impactful that a myth gives us a way to see ourselves in a story that's depersonalized. Like, ah, there I am. Cool. Ah, I know that. I know Sisyphus. I know that experience of mindlessly pushing a boulder up a mountain just to get to the top. It rolls back down and then I do it all over again. Huh, there I am. Cool. So that ability to like have to take a perspective on yourself, to be outside yourself for a moment, then allows you to come back and say, do I want to continue to make that choice to push this boulder up the mountain? I can now get back in the driver's seat because I've seen the kind of car that I'm driving. I'm using a billion metaphors here. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And psychedelics are that psychedelics are the opportunity to like get outside of oneself far enough that then I can come back and say, do I consciously want to choose to continue to be the way that I've seen that I am? Or do I want to like use my power my influence over myself to make different choices. Mm. Wow. Well, yeah, thank you so much, Mackenzie. I think that's, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there for sure. Um, So I think we're going to have to start closing up in a little bit. I think we have already gone past what we were initially thinking. um, And it's really hard. That was obvious that was going to happen. (laughs) <laughs> it, 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 it was kind of obvious and also it's kind of funny because we didn't even when I said we, we, in the beginning when we started I was like we have to get to the dreams like we have to be able to talk about the dreams and well here we are now but maybe this is just a sign that we should do another one of these and really dedicate some more time for it and um, because this has been so much fun and I also feel like I've learned so much just just during this hour of together and um it's so nourishing to 
come together with you two and share these dif- these different perspectives that come from the same source. But I, I feel like it really just enriches my own thinking. And um, yeah, it's just been really lovely. So I would just li- like to ask you both if you would like to have anything to close for t- today before we... Um, wrap up the session so any thoughts or anything that still comes to mind before we close i have a three-liner on dreams because you brought it up but i'm not going to open up that conversation (laughs) um when i was doing my study in peru i was in niwe rao and one morning after a session there was an integration circle and the two main shamans were like really bickering with each other and being the israeli that i am i asked the translator i was like What's going on? He's like, oh, this guy dreamt about this guy and they're trying to figure it out. So obviously my my nerd, Jungian nerd dream like was like, oh, okay, this is an opportunity. I was like, what do they think about dreams? And he asked the main uh, shaman who was Ricardo and he's, his answer was a meditation. He's like, dream world, ayahuasca world, same world. That's it. That was the answer, which I've been trying to which for me on a resonance intuition level, I was like, yeah, of course, it's just a validation. But I've been unpacking that over and over through the years. So to think, right, there's, those are just two vehicles to get to, us to the same place. Yeah. yeah. And what does that mean for us about our dreams? Let alone what McKenzie is studying, which is dreams that are related to psychedelics, which is... Well, I mean, the the ancient Greek word for the place that was visited at night and the place that was visited when you went to the Eleusian temples and took LSD was the underworld. It was the same world. They did not differentiate. And I mean, that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly the shamanic perspective as well, or the, the, the Shipipo perspective, like we're going to the same place. And that like, yeah, I don't know, just... I think my closing thought is the underworld, the unconscious, the dream world, the psychedelic world, whatever we want to call it, like there's a tendency to, because it's unknown, the unknown creates a projection screen, right? So we, pr- we see it as what we believe it is. Jung says, if we approach the unconscious with hostility, it will show us its hostile face. If we approach with friendliness, we will see her friendly face. And this is so much about set and setting and psychedelics, but like, I, I tend to make a big show of the big, scary, powerful aspect of the, of the psyche and of psychedelic work, because it is big and scary and powerful and it grips me and I can't help it. But also like, um, it's really important to recognize that we've been enculturated and socialized to be afraid of this. That fear is not because it's scary. So like when we come into psychedelic work, when we come into dream work, if the if there is fear there, that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be feared. And there's there's some aspect of like I can approach this with curiosity and openness and put a friendly face on put a wow thank you for being here like my shadow thank you for holding all of my uniqueness for all of these years that I couldn't bear it like thank you that's awesome you did that for me right so we can we can actually enter into the relationship with the underworld from a place of I'm so glad you're here Um, instead of projecting our fear of what the unknown contains. Absolutely. And I'm going to add that to my concluding. Um, Thank you, Mackenzie. And two things. One is to jump on what you said, which is the way we relate to psychedelics is how we relate to everything. And people don't understand that yet. Psychedelics are a mirror to your inner relational world. What you do with your experience after is probably how you relate to other things inside of you and in how you relate to the world. So if one word that I wanna emphasize is relationships. Build a relationship with your practice. And like any relationship, the more attention, time, 
care, love you put in curiosity, which is one of my favorite words ever, you put into it, it will blossom. If you reject it, if you negate it, if you avoid it, it will look a certain way. And the second word is integration. We can, we can do a probably like a six hour thing about that and just start scratching the surface. But if there is really, it's so, I can't speak enough about how important it is for people, for all of us to understand that the next frontier of psychedelics will be the research of integration, the research and application. Because right now it's like the neglected child on the way to making it legal. But eventually it will become the, the, the child that we need to nurture and we need to make grow. So invest in your integration, research your integration, search for places that can offer you that container that Mackenzie was talking about to really take your experience to the next level to create long-term change. And thank you both. This has been really, really illuminating. Yeah, agreed. agreed. Mm -hmm. All right. So with this, we're going to close today's podcast. So this was Ido Cohen and Mackenzie Amara. I'm sure we can drop some links uh, for both of your websites. I know, Ido, you're very active on Instagram. And Mackenzie, you are a little bit active on Instagram as well. And uh, we'll just drop the links in the description box. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can get together again because that would be really amazing. Yeah, let's talk about dreams. I want to hear Mackenzie talk about dreams. <laughs> yes. <gasps>